right, hey everybody. Um, I hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. Uh, my name is Eli. I am the exhibit and registration manager here at AAID, and I want to welcome you all to this week's case of the week. Today, our speaker is Dr. Ron Zokol. Dr. Zokol graduated in 1974 from the University of British Columbia's Faculty of Dentistry. He holds a fellowship with the AAID and is a diplomate of the American Board of Oral Implantology and the International Congress of Dental Implantologists. He is a past chair of the General Examination Committee responsible for establishing the standard of care for, gen for, general, excuse me, for general dentists in the province of British Columbia. Dr. Zokol um, was also the surgical for Mish Implant Institute for 10 years. He founded the Pacific Institute of Advanced Dental Education in 1996 and lectured locally and internationally for more than 25 years in prosthodontics and surgery. In 2018, Dr. Zokol um, was also involved in the foundation of the Dental, or the Digital Dentistry Institute and provided that provides CE programs in North America, Asia, Europe, Africa, and Australia. Having been in private practice from 1974 to two, sorry, to, to 2014, <laughs> excuse me, um, he now continues to practice in BC Perio in Vancouver, Canada, with a team of periodontists and prosthodontists, providing services in advanced surgical and prosthetic rehabilitation. Dr. Zokol, thank you so much for being here with us today, and welcome to the uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Eli. I very much appreciate it. Am I okay to start sharing my screen? Of course, yeah, you're all set, ready to go. Very, very good. Well, I want to say hello to everybody, and... Uh, and uh, probably a good evening to those of you on the East Coast and uh, good afternoon to those of you on the West Coast. Today we have a case which I think uh, you'll find actually quite interesting. It probably has a lot for everybody, probably the person or the surgeon, uh, oral implantologist with moderate to a lot of extensive experience would be helpful, but also information for the person in their early learning curve. I come to you from Vancouver, Canada, which you should see in the background right there. And uh, the core of the subject today, if I can get my mouse to work here. Oh, fun here. Let me just take a second here. There we go. Looks like we're rolling. This is a posterior maxilla revision case. And uh, Eli was kind enough to give me a, a nice introduction. I'd want to let you know that that my CV is available upon request and be happy to send anybody uh, that information. The case study that we have today has a couple of objectives. And one is to understand the etiological factors that, that created the problem that we're faced with here. A little bit of information on diagnosis and treatment planning, principles of advanced soft tissue and uh, particular bone grafting, complications management, as well as patient communication, which we're gonna show might be a very important factor in what we're doing. The patient today is a 39 year old, healthy Caucasian male, no allergies or medical issues, uh, good oral hygiene, no contraindications for surgery, missing the maxillary right posterior dentition and a good part of the maxilla in that area as well. But the balance of the teeth are relatively healthy. There is an occlusion issue to some degree, which may be contributory to the loss of the upper right teeth. And as you can see here, you can notice the cusp is in crossbite and therefore the balancing forces that are generated on the posterior dentition uh, are quite considerable. And we see this scenario happening quite a bit. Now, when you take a look at the periodontal condition of all teeth, you can recognize that the, certainly we, we have an issue related to force has been the primary etiology of where this got started, but that's not the whole story because this person has a significant dental history. In fact, when we take a look at what has transpired for this person, uh, a general dentist was in to treat uh, first molar endo, found that the complications in that area referred to uh, an endodontist who went in surgically, did a root amputation on the mesial buccal root. Uh, that was unfortunately complicated with a post-op infection, which then the patient was referred to a periodontist who extracted the molar and attempted to do a, uh, a ridge regeneration, bony regeneration of the ridge. That was held with complications and the case was referred to an oral surgeon 
who had who did a sinus graft, which had complications as well. So this person has gone through three specialists with significant complications to surgical procedures. And I think it was as a last resort, the patient was referred to me to see if there was anything that I could possibly do. And when you have cases like this, and I've had the fortune or misfortune of having to deal with a number of these cases as a last resort. And the, some of the talking points that we have for patients that are in this category is, first of all, understanding what is the factors that are leading to this. In other words, the etiology. What was the role of occlusion? Uh, what were the yeah, iatrogenic factors here? Because as a result of work that was done by previous dentists, this person has lost a massive amount of bone structure, not just the tooth structure, but bone structure as well. And to what degree were patient compliance factors involved in the failure of the surgical procedures that were there? So when we are faced with a condition where we are uncertain as to the potential, uh, it's important to recognize that there are three competent surgeons involved with this and the patient had a problem. So the prognosis is extremely guarded. So we, we make no warranties, for example, that we're gonna get any type of a good result. And really what we wanna do is that we wanna ensure the patient that, yeah, we've had done things like this before. Yes, we've had good results, but we've also had failures as well. So there's no guarantee here. One of the important considerations is that because we are faced with a significant treatment plan, in this case here, that once we have a particular problem, we have complications, we're gonna stop because we don't wanna be somebody who's adding significantly to the, to the problem. And the radiographs that you see here, you note the significant amount of bone loss. You note the oral antral bony fenestration uh, that's there that is, that's covered over by soft tissue, as you'll see in, in the photographs that will come up in a moment here. But the important thing is to recognize the severity of the bony defect and if you're going to put implant supported restorations in this area, what do you have to do? Well, one of the things you have to do is make sure the patient is gonna be fully compliant to your instructions. And, and they cannot be marginalized in all, any shape or form. Some conditions that we treat in the mouth, it really doesn't matter whether the patients are compliant or not. We can generally get a pretty good result. And some cases are exactly the opposite where patient compliance is almost everything. You have to provide a found, sound surgical foundation, but the way the person treats that for the next several months is critical. So when we take a look at a three-dimensional uh, rendering of a CT scan, you can see the nature of the bone defect there. In fact, if you take a look at one area or near next to that uh, bony fenestration in the oral antral area there, there is a 30 plus millimeter vertical defect. Now that can be solved pretty quickly, by doing a sinus graft in that area. But where the ridge actually exists to where the alveolar process ought to be extended is about a 12 meter vertical defect. And the objective of the patient is to regenerate all that tissue back and give teeth back 100% looking like and with gum tissue surrounding it that makes it look like he's never lost teeth before. Very, very ambitious. The probability for success is incredibly low incredibly low, Prog prognosis is very poor. But the patient is 39 years old, he makes his life in front of a camera and, and people, and, and he wanted this pretty badly. So when we take a look and analyze the character of the osseous defect, you can see the nature of it. We have about a 10 millimeter palatal defect there, vertical defect of the palate. Uh, the, we have an oral antral uh, bony fenestration which is gonna come into account. And this will give you a better idea of how that looks. Now, taking a look at the gingival defect, note on the uh, slide in the middle that we see a transition, a mucogingival junction that is mid-crestal for whatever the crest is. And there is a vertical defect where the palatal mucosa attaches directly to the facial mucosa. And, and there is no gingival tissue from the midline to the extending facially from there. And if we are anticipating doing any type of a bone graft or any surgery right there, one of the criteria is, is that we need soft tissue that we can suture to. And obviously in this condition, there just is not that situation occurring. So 
with the guarded prognosis that we have here, we move forward with this area. Our general objectives, first of all, implant supported teeth with natural clinical crown height, ambitious for sure. Bone volume for implants. Well, if we're gonna do that, we have to close the antral bony fenestration. We need a sinus elevation graft and we need a vertical onlay graft to achieve that kind of result situation. And you can see on the right side, uh, what is a positive is that we do have a wall of bone on the distal surface of the, of the cuspid right there. And, and the arrow points to that. That is a significant factor in rebuilding those tissues as it provides a blood supply from bone. And then we can build from there with a little bit more predictability. It's still a very ambitious surgery, but it's possible. But we don't have keratinized tissue volume for surgical control at this time. So first steps first, create a situation where you have the potential to do a bone graft. And with that, we need to make sure that the soft tissue is right. Now, the thought process in treatment planning this, of course, is the tooth position determines the implant position. The implant positions determine the bony volume and morphology, and the biomechanics and, and aesthetics are improved with regeneration of alveolar bone. So we're gonna try and rebuild all that bone structure and such. So we also need a vertical bone onlay graft and that requires closure of the oral antral fenestration and increase of the os osseous vascularization. And what do I mean by that? I mean, the actual amount of bone presently there is, is limited in its vascular supply. Therefore, doing too much at one time may be a bit of a challenge. So by, by doing the sinus graft first and developing a significant volume of bone and a significantly higher degree of vascularization in that area, then doing a vertical onlay graft has a greater potential for success. And of course, we need predictable soft tissue closure if we have any expectation of the bone graft to succeed. Alveolar process is the thought process in reverse, actually. So the treatment will start off by soft tissue. So we're going to uh, try to do the soft tissue, keratinized soft tissue graft here, avoiding antral com complications. In other words, we're gonna do a sharp tissue dissection and avoid perforating into the antrum in that area. We'll do the sinus elevation following a successful soft tissue graft, close the fenestration, augment the avascular bed, then reconstruct the alveolar process, place the implants, and do the gingival refinements that are necessary and prosthetics. So those are the sequence of treatments here. So soft tissue control involves passive primary closure. And in order to get these, these grafts to work properly, isolation from the oral cavity is absolutely essential. And, and therefore we have to make sure that we can get primary closure and maintain it. Uh, those of you who have tried to suture to mucosal tissue will recognize that it is incredibly fragile. Sutures don't hold and incision line opening is highly predictable when you don't have a primary passive closure with the suture lines facially and palatally in keratinized tissue. Now, I wanna show by example, another type of a case here that we did, another advanced bone graft case that we had to look at. So this is strictly as an example of some of the stuff that you have to do. This is the floor of the mouth is higher actually than the alveolar process. And of course, a vertical bone graft was requested here. And therefore you had to regenerate the soft tissue to do that. And uh, when we when did this, we did a sharp dissection. We maintained the periosteum, avoided complications with the adjacent uh, uh, neuro neurovascular bundle in the mental uh, foramen area. And uh, having done that, harvested a, a very significant piece of soft tissue, and we applied that, sutured it to the periosteum. And when we did that, we brought the patient back just short of two weeks, and it was becoming vascularized. And this patient also had a complication with, with uh, healing from surgical procedures, which led to this multiple surgical disaster situation, losing the vertical bone that she did. Well, once we were able to establish that, we had a three month post-op here where we had a very lovely bed of keratinized tissue, attached keratinized tissue. And now we have the ability to manipulate these tissues, suture these uh, flaps, uh, the buccal and lingual flaps, and have a reasonable expectation of maintaining closure. Now we go back to our case in hand today, 
And we're going to apply those same principles here. And we're going to do a sharp tissue dissection in order to uh, increase the keratinized tissue on the facial aspect here. And we need to do that without perforating the periosteum over that oral antral fistula. And now, by the way, that fenestration, this is a fenestration I'm talking about on your right hand side there. And that's just an overlay. But when we did the sharp tissue dissection, this is what we that was we had ended up with here. So we managed to not perforate in, we managed to leave a bed of periosteum in place, and we harvested a very, very significant part of the palate. And I'll show you a harvest uh, picture as well. And we close that up. This is the area of increased keratinized tissue that we're able to find. And of course, we eliminated that vertical defect at the mucogingival junction, which uh, would have also played a little bit of a problem in making sure that we got good tissue management. In any case, with that, we added a bed of keratinized tissue that we could work with. So our first step in surgery with this patient has been successful. The patient who has been perhaps non-compliant or whatever reason uh, failures in the past have occurred, at least we got through this one step. And now we're going to proceed with closure of the, of the sinus a fen bony fenestration as well. This is the palatal harvest, by the way, on the left side, you can see it took most of the palate on the patient's left side, ranging right from the anterior, right to the distal the second molar. And as you can see, and a, probably about a 15 millimeter vertical on that, 10 week post-op on the right. So it all granulated in and to the credit of this patient, not a peep, not a word of discomfort related to the granulation area of that palate as it, as it healed. Uh, I was surprised at that. Now, our next step, in when we start to work with the uh, management of the bone volume, we do a full thickness flap. And as you would expect, that the periosteal, periosteum on the, on the surface there is intimate with this cnidarian membrane of the sinus. And as soon as we laid the full uh, thickness flap there, we had an immediate perforation into the right maxillary antrum here. And you can see the bony defect. And our, we made a decision at this point, and that is the, the opening that we had into the sinus at the crest of the ridge was large enough where we could manipulate the Snyderian membrane and do the elevation without going to the lateral wall and going and accessing the sinus from the, uh, from the uh, lateral aspect. So when we did that, we put a biomend membrane in place there. Biomend membrane has a, I believe it has a, uh, a barrier effectiveness of about eight weeks, but it's a certain rigidity to this membrane. And it is, it, when you when you fold it up like that and put it in, it has a tendency to, to rebound back, which is beautiful because as it expands back to its original position, it forms the superior wall uh, that you'll see on the right-hand side there. You can see the, uh, the, the medial aspect of the, of the sinus or the lateral aspect of the nasal cavity that the uh, membrane has been elevated from and the superior aspect is formed by that biomend membrane. And that allows us then to build a graph, probably 15 plus millimeters in vertical height. There's more than we needed. We added a little bit more bone to the external aspect of that, put a barrier, and that's a bio guide barrier. And that is a, uh, a, another collagen membrane. It is not cross-linked, but has a memory of about 24 weeks, uh, where it, it, not a memory, but a, a resistance to deterioration. So its effectiveness as a barrier la lasts for about 24 weeks. Passive primary closure on the sutures and having control there, we see a five week post-op where, where now the tissues have healed significantly. And we have undergone our second significant surgery and the patient has come through with flying colors. I'm looking like we're rather optimistic about getting a result at this point because I was very hesitant to believe that we'd get anywhere with this particular case. So the post-off radiograph after the sinus graph notes that we have a very significant vertical increase in bone volume provided all turns over to bone. And with that, we have an expectation now that whatever we do from here on in, we can put implants into that area and provide a prosthesis uh, for that patient. And after the healing, we sit down with the patient and have a chat with them. We do our surgical evaluation. We realize that we've gotten significant improvement in the gingival tissue, which allowed us to go to a bone graft. 
Uh, we did a sinus elevation graft with the fenestration closure and a lot more uh, bone uh, vascularization so that we can, we can provide nourishment for a vertical bone graft uh, should we do that. So we have superior surgical results than we had the right to anticipate. And so we're now faced with the next step. And one of the options that we had to present to our patient here is that we can stop here. We can put implants in and put a, a prosthesis more like a, an FP3 prosthesis under the Miss Judy protocols for our nomenclature, if you will. So we can restore tooth as well as gingival tissue on a splinted prosthesis. Uh, the patient was pretty adamant, he was feeling pretty good that he wanted to go and he wanted to do a vertical bone graft. Well, that's fun because this vert vertical bone graft is very, very significant. You can see the height that's there. And, uh, and that raises a number of issues. Number one, you got to secure it and stabilize it, but then you got to get complete soft tissue closure over that. And that is a bit of a challenge when you're working in the maxilla because that palatal tissue has no flexibility whatsoever. Uh, you can do a lot with the facial tissues and you expand that to bring it up over the ridge, but the palatal tissues are a little bit more of an issue. So here's what this looks like here. We want the discussion points here that we talk about is the soft tissue closure requirements. They have to be primary passive closure and complete coverage of the titanium mesh. That's essential, okay? Issues. None of the uh, none for facial tissues. We can expand those tissues out. We can release those tissues and uh, and make sure that they can cover up to the midcrustal area of the graft here. But the palatal tissues have no elasticity, and we have to account for that. And what I did here was a palatal split thickness bipedical flap, and uh, and what that means is that we use a sharp dissection to allow uh, the teeth, and I see uh, maybe my image is overlapping that just a little bit more than ideal, but we did a mid incision line, closure is what we're looking for. So we want the facial tissues to come up to midline, but we want the palatal tissues also to come up to the midline. So the split thickness flap leaves a base at the superior aspect of the palatal uh, titanium mesh in place, but we slide that split thickness up towards the crest of the ridge here. So we have complete, uh, the periosteum covers the superior aspect, the sliding pedicle covers the inferior aspect on the palate and, and it must overlap the periosteum superiorly so none of the titanium mesh is actually exposed. A barrier membrane is put over top of that and the tissue is closed at the crest and the palatal tissue is sutured to the, the periosteum that was retained underneath there as well. The actual titanium mesh extends past that margin of keratinized tissue that you see, but it's underneath the periosteum uh, superiorly that is wide open. Now, more than the, the key in principle here is that if the titanium mesh, uh, or excuse me, the, the, the gingival tissue level at the time that we made the incision is where that green line is, we have to leave enough of that sliding pedicle to overlap the periosteum by about five millimeters. And that will ensure adhesion of those tissues and isolation of the graft and the titanium mesh. This is an immediate post-op radiograph of the surgery. And we're feeling pretty good that perhaps if this grows bone that we'll have a solution that, that might work. One week post-op, we see everything is handling and granulating in nicely. Uh, everything's going as well as I would want. Six week post-op, we're noticing a fenestration in the soft tissue, exposure of the titanium mesh. And that is right in the second premolar, first molar region. We see thinning of the, of the tissue over the titanium on the premolar, first premolar area, the bluishness that you see there. And this is a common problem with titanium meshes. Tissue that is mobile over titanium mesh finds that there's some damage. And of course, when you have injury to tissue, even at the localized small area there, that injury to the tissue causes a release of collagenase and soft tissue is deteriorated, will also increase the potential for 
osteoclastic activity and reduction of osteoblastic activity. So inflammatory responses due to soft tissue injury are no friend of ours. And you leave it over enough time and a lot of this area of the titanium will become exposed. So once we have a fenestration through the soft tissue and exposure of the titanium mesh, there is a protocol that we recommend. And I'll share that with you eventually, but for the purpose of right now, I want to show you what happens over a period of time. So at the same time as we took those images, this is the area of occlusion. And you can see that if by chance this were to be successful, then we have a great potential to achieve the results we're looking for. However, that wasn't to be the case. We have an increase in the exposure of the titanium mesh. We go over instructions again. We bring the patient back again, and we have more exposure. And this ultimately is an abject failure. And I schedule the patient for to come in. We're going to remove the titanium mesh. We did. We got rid of all the granulation tissue, close it up, put a lot of platelet-rich fibrin uh, membrane in there, close it up with a, uh, a dermal matrix over top there just to close it, help close the area and keep it as comfortable as possible and reschedule the patient for an eight month consultation. Once the tissues have healed and matured, we're gonna reevaluate and, and we have a chance to we discuss what we wanna do. So I recommended at this point that the patient consider proceeding with prosthetics because we've now had a failure. And as per our original agreement, once we have that failure, uh, we're going to wash our hands of it, move forward, and at least we can give him teeth. Patient requested retreatment of the graft. And I was rather astounded, and quite frankly, and I advised him against further surgery, but he was pretty adamant about it. And I asked him why. And he says, because I can take care of it better. And that's a very, very interesting statement that he would acknowledge that. And so I said, well, I, I, I was really, really opposed to doing because I had my doubts that he could take care of it better or would take care of it better. So I said, I'm gonna charge you exactly the same amount that I charged you the first time, trying to dissuade him of going further. But he wanted to proceed nonetheless. And of course, I approved that and I said, fine. Potential for so graft success is low. There is restorative solutions in place just by what we have to do. If we put implants in and uh, we can do a prosthetic solution, if we put the implants in and presume that we're going to have a graft failure, if we're still trying to extend it further, and we have a thought that the graft might not work, that the patient's adamant and trying, then if I put the implants in their absolutely ideal position, they would extend about eight to 10 millimeters out of the bone. In which case, if a graft failure occurred, the quality of a prosthetic solution would be really, really poor. However, if I extended four to five millimeters out of the bone only, and we had a graft failure, and without an awful lot more bone loss, we might have a solution, even though it's certainly less than ideal. But so I hedged on this one, and I said, okay, I had no expectation that we're going to get a good result here. So when I put these implants in, we took the prostheses uh, in the diagnostic wax up, created a template for the placement of the implants. So we put the implants in. These here are intralock implants. And we put those in and you can see they're a little high and dry here, but they're not as long as they could have been. And, but they're out four and five millimeters from the bone, depending on which area that you're looking at. And when we, when we put that in and did the bone graft up to that area there, put the titanium mesh graft in place here. Now, because it didn't have the height of the earlier one, we didn't have the bipedical split thickness flap that we're using did not have to be as aggressive and therefore we're able to achieve that with a little bit more ease. This is the immediate post-op radiograph and we're quite happy with the results. But this is the nine day post-op and you can see that we now have an opening exposing the titanium mesh exactly as I anticipated. This is going to be another one of those failures. So we sat down with the patient and said, here we are again. It's exactly the same as before. And here is the regime I want you to follow to see if we can recover from this case in some fashion here. And I'm hoping beyond hope. So he comes back six weeks later, six week post-op, and that is closed up quite a bit. This is the opening on a nine days post-op. This is six weeks post-op. And 
I was I was struck by the fact that we have soft tissue migration over titanium mesh, and I don't think I've ever seen that before. And I'm going to share the protocols with you that created that. So this is this is the difference. And as we post into the uh, nine week post-op period, you can see it's closed up even more. When it came time to uncover the implants, do a stage two procedure, remove the titanium mesh, it had all but completely closed right up here. So the home care regime I wanna share with you is this, and it's not that I've heard this before, but it made sense to me. And, and this is what I articulated to our patient here. Now, whatever we're do, talking about here, I want them to do six times a day. I don't care if it's 12 times a day, but I want him to do a minimum of six times a day. I want him to clean the defect and the membrane with a Sonicare toothbrush. I like the vibration characteristics of the Sonicare toothbrush and, uh, and it has less rotary movement of the bristles and yet gets the job done. So that's a personal preference. I then want him to dab with chlorhexidine, 0.12% several times, but don't rinse it off right away. Just let it, just let it stay there for a bit. And then I want to take some, uh, some OxyFresh dental gel, generous amount, and compress it into that wound area over the titanium mesh. Do not rinse off. You can spit out the excess, but don't try and wash it away. Now, now it's the interesting thing about OxyFresh dental gel. Many of you may be aware of this material here, but it's something I've been using for several decades right now, thanks to a, a dentist who came to one of my courses many, many, many years ago and showed me this. But uh, OxyFresh dental gel's uh, primary component is stabilized chlorine dioxide. And in the presence of a low pH or infection or what have you, it releases oxygen. It also contains chamomile and aloe vera. Therefore, it's a bit of a soothing agent and sedative to the soft tissues, but it heals areas like crazy. So you repeat daily until the next appointment. And he went out and did that. And that's how he got to where he was. So these are the components of this regime that I'm recommending. I like the Sonicare toothbrush, the Paradex, 0.12% chlorhexidine, and the, uh, the OxyFresh dental gel. And I, I note that even though we had to buy it through a through a, a, I think it's more of like a pyramid program for many, many years. It's now being offered by some dental supply companies. I think I've managed to influence enough doctors over the years that uh, it's now becoming a, a mainstay for many surgeons in healing of soft tissue. So when we now are at the point where we're going to remove the titanium mesh and, the, and, and take a look at the results of, of this here, the titanium mesh comes out and that's bone. And I say, hmm, not bad. Uh, not what I expect to be able to do. And, and to some degree, I was a little aghast at myself because I, I, I certainly did not expect our patient to be as compliant uh, as he was. Had I known that he would be, I'd extended those implants another four or five millimeters, and we could have had the result that we would have ideally predicted uh, for the past. But ultimately, what we have here is a, a case where everything is identical to one complete failure and one complete success. The difference and only difference from one procedure to the next is patient compliance. That's the only difference there is. And therefore, it draws to mind the importance of ensuring that when we communicate with our patients, the importance of getting them to do what we would like them to do is so critical in some cases. In this case, it was absolutely essential. And I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that, that he did his work as well. So we layered that with PRF. We put a flap in place here, another dermal matrix to thicken up the tissues here and sutured together and allowed it to heal. So ultimately we're faced with this condition here. This is, uh, this is a condition where you can see the implants with the onlay graft around the implants. You can see how we've regenerated bone all the way up to the crest of module of for all four implants, 360 degrees around, and it's been stable now for about seven years. Uh, this is a prosthesis. So you can see I fudged on extending the length of the implants out and therefore had to have a 
prosthetic congenital component to that. But ultimately, it, uh, it worked where we were able to create a solution. We might argue as to what would be better to do crown and bridge on this case or do a splinted fixed hybrid uh, or that. That ultimately, the result was the patient got his teeth back and uh, he was able to carry on with his life. And to that end then, I just wanna say thank you very much for the opportunity to present this case. I hope it was valuable for you. And uh, please note that I have my email address there if you should wanna contact me and my cell phone number, if you wanna make a note of that, you're more than welcome to give me a call at any time to discuss this case or anything like it. And I'd be most happy to entertain your questions. So I'll stop sharing right here and have Eli come on back. All right, I do have one question so far. If anybody else is typing, feel free to continue typing those questions into the chat or uh, Q&A box, or if you're watching us on Facebook, type it in there as well. Um, but the first question I have is, um, is there an advantage to using PRF membrane membranes over TI mesh to prevent exposure? Yes, yes. And, and today, uh, I think in a, in a case like that, uh, I would incorporate PRF membrane segments into the graft material itself. I would layer the area over the titanium mesh as well, but that's not as critical. The barrier by itself gives you all you need to do that. But I would put over top of the barrier on top, which goes over the titanium mesh, I put platelet rich fibrin membranes over top of that for the soft tissue closure and the healing factors related to soft tissue. But a, a, a PRF membrane directly over the titanium mesh isn't going to do as much. Remember, it needs a vascular supply. It's going to take quite a while for that vascular supply to get to that membrane because you've got you're going to put a barrier membrane over top of that. And uh, that inhibits uh, any type of uh, vascular co uh, connection with the PRF membrane, which it needs in order to do its job. Thank you. All right. Another question. Um, what is the time frame of the case from beginning to end? Uh, well, remember we had that eight month period of healing through that first uh, surgical disaster. So he was about two and a half years in this case here from start to stop. When you take a look at soft tissue healing, first bone graft healing, uh, then uh, the next healing followed by, uh, followed by eight months of further healing, and then another bone graft in the healing of that, followed by, followed by the prosthesis generation. We, I think we, we marked it down at about two and a half years from start to stop. It's one of the reasons actually that, that I elected to fudge on the extension of the implants outside the jawbone so that we could end up with a prosthetic solution uh, in the event that we had a failure. We actually ultimately got a success and uh, but that's the way we, we make judgment calls. And my best interest was making sure the patient got a result, a prosthetic result in the end that he could be satisfied with and could be stable over the long period. All right, thank you. Um, next question is, were you using um, allograph or autogenous, Sorry, not autogenous, that autogenous bone? Yeah, autogenous bone. <laughs> um, and this then the follow-up question, question <laughs> is, is if question. allograph, um, yeah. What was it 70-30, um, min or demin? I'm not sure if I'm saying those right. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and here's, here's the important point here. And I recall I was a panelist uh, with two periodontists and two oral surgeons in Fort Lauderdale a good many years ago. And one of the questions that came from the audience was, uh, what's your favorite bone grafting material? And both the periodontist and the oral surgeon says, well, this is what I use, this is what I use, and all four were different. And it came to me answering the questions, I says, it doesn't matter as much. What's key is the environment of the bone graft itself. And if you rob that area of a soft tissue vascularized supply and give it a, a bone, uh, an osseous vascular supply and inhibit fibrous uh, connective tissue invagination or competition in that area, you'll grow bone. Now you'll grow bone better with better materials, but you'll grow bone either way. It might take a bit longer, but you'll grow bone. So in this case here, the environment was there, but we used 
that bone graft material in this case here was a fourth generation bone graft material from, uh, from Exactec. It's called Regeniform. And the characteristic of that material is that when you hydrate it, it actually starts to set. It gets into a firm gel. And so as it sets into a firm gel, you can form the alveolar process quite nicely. You can actually wash it and vacuum it and suction that area without the graft actually dispersing. So the handling characteristics are one of the things that made that particularly valuable. Today, we would, we would probably rehydrate it with plasma and cause it to set with autologous thrombin and calcium chloride. Uh, and we have a number of ways of causing those bone graft materials to set. So the handling characteristics are gonna be much superior to the things that we were using, let's say 20, 25 years ago. So, but I would say this, I'd say for those of you who are looking to do more advanced bone grafting, one have, have good handling characteristics. If you're using PRF, also consider using either plasma or uh, rehydrating graft with, uh, your grafts with PRP, because we will also harvest uh, PRP at 45 times base human value, add autologous thrombin calcium chloride to cause it to set. Uh, there's a lot of ways of handling that graft material. So it, handling characteristics are really, really strong. And it's a large part of control of your surgical environment uh, when you are able to uh, manage your materials like that. So the important thing is managing materials so you can create an environment for the bone graft to create that solution. The bone graft material itself is secondary. Next question. Um, do you prefer tenting over TI mesh when possible? Tenting over TI, uh, TI mesh, uh, are we talking about implant supported or otherwise? I, I'm, I'll take your guess, I guess. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to perhaps make some presumptions for that question. Titanium mesh, uh, it depending on how it's being utilized. If you put the implants in and put a titanium mesh barrier over top of that, then you can secure it to the implants and it'll be pretty stable. Uh, also, we've done titanium mesh where we have not used implants as a foundation and just use bone screws to hold it on the facial or lingual or palatal walls, what have you. And they've been equally successful. The most important thing is, is that you can expect the patient to compress that area to some degree during their daily functions. Therefore, the rigidity of the titanium mesh is absolutely essential if you don't have an implant support factor on the occlusal aspect. And, and that's really important. So if you're using a very flexible titanium mesh, you're gonna struggle with success because the most important thing is that you gotta keep that bone graft absolutely dead stable and make sure it doesn't move. And I want you, I want you to consider that, that situation where you have uh, a bone graft in here and, it, and it, as it's vascularizing and you have blood vessels growing through that graft and it is the osteoblastic ac clastic activity is taking away the bone graft material, laying down new bone through osteoblastic activities, and it's just forming new blood vessels, neovascularization, and that graft now, and it goes, just shifts ever so slightly. Internally, where you have that neovascularization, that shift is massive, and it starts to break those neovascular structures. And when it does, that's tissue injury. What happens with tissue injury? You have an inflammatory response. You have an increased amount of osteoclastic activity, inhibition of osteoblastic activity, and a generation of collagenase, all of which is exactly what you don't want with your bone graft. So the more movement you have with the graft, the more potential you have for failure. Therefore, the rigidity of that titanium mesh becomes essential when patients are as minimally compliant and perhaps would put pressure on it. If it distorts the membrane, you distort the graft. Therefore, the rigidity of the titanium mesh is essential. If you can tent it up with the implant, it in reduces the potential for that distortion. All right, next question. And I think this is my final question so far. So if you have any more questions, feel free to type them in before we um, end. Um, is there an advantage of using titanium mesh over titanium reinforced um, E or D PTFE membranes in this case? I. I I, I think using titanium mesh over top of reinforced Gore-Tex membrane. And I, if I can interpret that question that way. Probably. I don't yeah. think so. I, I, 
I don't think so. The reinforced Gore-Tex is a, is, is a good material to use provided you don't expose the Gore-Tex. Uh, when that happens, you can have a bit of a mess and, and therefore it's not. Either, all of these materials have their positives and negative factors. Titanium mesh has a particular characteristic where you've got to really be careful because the soft tissue over top of titanium mesh will deteriorate over time. If I, I, I have a patient, I had a patient where I, I said to, uh, I said to them, I said, look, we just did a bone graft for you. And if I can put you in a coma for three months, I'm going to get my very best results. And, and, uh, the patient's husband was there and a big smile came across his face and he says, yeah, we can do that. And I was rather shocked. And I, he looked over to me again. He says, yeah, he says, I'm an anesthesiologist. <laughs> I had a good laugh about that. We all did. But the point is more than anything else is that if a person is not mobile and is not using their mouth at all, then all these structures remain stable. And we have the, by far a better opportunity for a high quality result. Um, so my, our goal is to really get the patient to to be as compliant as we possibly can. If we have an incision line opening on Gore-Tex, we have a bacterial invasion in that area and the Gore-Tex can become a nidus for infection. And that's one of the complications that occurs with that. With titanium mesh, we have a greater potential for exposure of the titanium mesh because of soft tissue deterioration. But as you can see with the regime that I put forward there, it's possible to control it, but the patient has to be very compliant. Perfect. Well, Dr. Zokol, thank you so much for being here. I think that's the end of our questions for today. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing this case with us. Um, it was great to learn and great to watch it. So thank you so much. Well, my pleasure. And uh, I think we scooted through that pretty darn quickly. So we're probably not a full hour here. Anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to address the Academy. Of course. Yeah, thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful evening and stay safe. All right. Thank you.